Welcome to the Samuel Andreev podcast. My guest today is Nuria Schönberg Nono. Nuria was born in Barcelona in 1932 to parents Arnold and Gertrude Schönberg. She grew up in Los Angeles and returned to Europe in 1954, marrying the composer Luigi Nono. In 1993, she founded the Luigi Nono Archive, and today she is president of the board of the Arnold Schönberg Center in Vienna. Nuria's experience is unique in that she has been close to two major 20th century composers, both of whom can be said to have had a lasting impact on the music of our time. Nuria, it is a great pleasure to welcome you to the podcast. Thank you. It's my pleasure. I have quite a lot of questions I'd like to ask you, but just to start with, maybe we could focus on what you're doing today. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about the activities of the Luigi Nono Center and what it does. Yes, uh, well, as you probably know, Luigi Nono died in 1990, and in 1993, uh, I was able <clears throat> to open a study center, uh, actually, uh, on the Judeca, where we, not in the house we lived, but in, a beautiful, uh, in beautiful rooms which belong to the city of Venice. Well, we have constantly people coming from all over the world to uh, study Nono's scores and his music in general. And today, I just came running back. That's why I'm kind of tired. I, I've just been in, in the archive showing <clears throat> some German students uh, the archives and the... the, the huge library of no-nos and explaining all the things that we do, which I can do if you ask me some questions. It's easier to answer questions than people. Okay? So, yes. So tell me a little bit more about what the goals of the center are then. Is it, is it primarily to uh, assist students and researchers, or is it also aimed at the broader public? Both. Uh, it, uh, it makes all of all of his his library, his correspondence, except for things that people have not, won't allow us to show, but almost everything, all of his correspondence, and uh, and all of his sketches for his works, which is probably the most important thing. And we have constantly uh, musicologists and musicians who come and want to study these. Uh, these copies actually that we show we don't show the originals uh they're kept in a very safe place uh so that they will last for a long time and but we do have everything in copies and therefore people can follow the process of his composition for each work of his that means we have all the sketches to the works and uh, they're all cataloged and organized very well. And they are available to anyone who wants to see them, not just musicologists and musicians, but if someone is curious, well, how did he write this work? Then he can take it out and say, so fait de onde, they can take out these photocopies and uh, study them. And at the same time, they can also listen to the work on, you know, on CDs and uh, sometimes see the video if we have something that explains what they're interested in or on his life, biographical material as well. And we have a huge library of something like, I think I just, I just got that thing, 16,000, 16, no, yeah. 16,000 books, <laughs> which were of his library. We make those available to be read in the archive, obviously. We do not lend them. Uh, and just, just today, that's why I'm a little bit tired. I was in the archive because there was a group of German students who came to visit and were particularly interested in his library, the things he read, and there's a young German musicologist who is working on the uh, annotations that he made in these thousands of books. 
and it's really very interesting, you know, for her. And it's going to be a very interesting study because he he mostly when he as he read, he put either he put no, this isn't true, or you know, a lot of question marks and, and exclamation points, but also comments. And so it makes it very interesting to read the things that he read and see his reaction to them. And this, this is going to be published also after when this young lady from Germany finishes her study. So that will be very interesting too. And we do have people coming from all over the world. And some stay for two days and some stays for two months. And some of them have been there for like 20 years. <laughs> so it's all very, it's, I would like to use the word fun for me. <laughs> I've been sick for about a month. And so this was the first time I went out and that I went back to the archive. And it was such a pleasure to see these young students who were so interested in all the, all the work that we have done with his originals, with the annotations and the books. There was someone who has worked on that. and just to see the, the whole setup there and see how open it is, because that's openness is the one thing I'm really, really, uh, you know, I, I really care a lot about. I, I, there's, almost, there's nothing hidden. There's nothing that we say, oh, only musicologists with a doctorate degree can, can look at these things. And no, uh, we want anyone who's interested in his music and his life, to be able to study these things or just know something about them. And I'm usually there every day to add what I personally know. That, that is, of course, a very precious thing. I'm, I'm thinking about a comment by Pierre Boulez, actually, who mentioned that one of the big obstacles to the dissemination of uh, Bruno Moderna's work was the fact that the manuscripts and the primary sources were in quite a terrible state after his death. Mm -hmm. And uh, the scores had not been edited properly and they were full of mistakes and it was difficult to get the parts and so on. And uh, he was commenting that things like that certainly can delay very substantially uh, the reception of a composer's work. So it's extremely precious to have uh, access to original documents, to high quality publications. And uh, of course, ideally, one would want a center like this to exist for every major composer. But I suppose that's not realistic. Can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I have another composer. That right. I'm president of, of the center in Vienna, <laughs> but I don't have to do as much work there because they have a wonderful situation. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are not supported by we're not supported by the city at all, and a little bit by, by the cultural ministry, but, you know, in a very sort of not the greatest way. But anyway, it works. And, and we work hard and everyone who's there is enthusiastic and wants to do, does more than they have to. <laughs> That's... Do you have the, a sense of the state of your late husband's reputation now in 2021 as a composer? his effect on the younger generation, uh, what his musical legacy might be? Well, I, I, it's something I'm interested in too. And I, I'd like to, I, I've been thinking of doing something this next year with the, no, 24, 2024, which is his 100th birthday year. Uh, it would be very interesting to, to do a, a study on on that, but to do it with the young composers and and people, maybe even from an audience once, you know, get the idea of what, what his music means today. To this. I must say it's performed pretty much. Anyway. <laughs> well, how have you seen the reception of his music change over the decades, from the various very earliest premieres that you might have heard of his music to the present day? Well, he has always been very lucky, at least during his lifetime, and 
mostly now too, that the people who play his music are people who really like it. And I mean, that's really important, you know, they're not being forced to. So uh, you have very, very good conductors and very good soloists and uh, musicians who, who enjoy playing this music and aren't doing it because they have to. And therefore, you get some really wonderful performances. And that's very lucky because that hasn't always been the case in the history of music. So uh, very grateful to, don't have to be grateful because if I say thank you to someone, they say, well, wait a minute, I'm not doing this for you. I'm doing it for the music. Did you already have a sense in the, in the 1950s, though, when you first knew him that uh, this was somebody who uh, who was making an impact or whose works were meeting with some kind of a, a positive critical reception at that time? Or was it really hard going at the beginning? No, <laughs> it, it was not real hard going because he was very well accepted in Darmstadt in the big international center for new music. And uh, he was uh, considered at that time probably the most important young composer whose works were played from very early in, in Darmstadt in the big international festivals, and then also in other German cities. Uh, in Italy, it's been a little slower, but that's to be expected. One thing I wanted to ask you about is, I'm very curious about this. There's a there's a letter from Luigi Nono that's published in his correspondence. I believe it's titled "Letter from L.A." Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I've read it in French only, so uh, so. Very bad translation. Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I was curious about this because, as you know, he had a rather negative impression of America when he first visited there. And I've wondered if that might have been a source of tension at the beginning, or if, if his views on America eventually did change, because uh, he, he goes on at some length about how, uh, I suppose, how, how naive and unprepared he finds people there, mm. and, um, and how unpleasant he found the experience. Well, yes, at first it was, it was really very unpleasant in, in Boston, his intoleranza was being performed at the, at a, the uh, city opera, I guess it was called. What's it called? Yeah, I think New York City. And uh, there were all kinds of things wrong. I mean, going wrong in the in the rehearsals. Things were missing, or they didn't work. And at, before the, at the first performance, there were pickets outside that said, dirty communists, go back to your, go back to Moscow. <laughs> so, <laughs> and yeah, it was not easy. It was not easy at all. So, so that was not so great. And even the performance was not so great in spite of the wonderful work that, that Bruno Moderna did as conductor. And actually, the musicians too—they were—they were fine, but uh, it was—it was not a very positive feeling there, and so so that was difficult. You know, it's hard. And in the end, the performance was actually quite a success. And then, right after that performance, we went to Los Angeles, and that's where that letter comes from, in Los Angeles. Did he have any contact at that time with some of the American ultramodernist composers, uh, Morton Feldman, uh, John Cage? Well, he had met them all at Darmstadt when they when they had come. Yes, he knew them. With Cage, we were friends because I was already friends. You know, he studied a little with my father, and uh, I knew him as a child, <laughs> and uh, so. Yes, G and then Gigi had met him, in, I guess, in Darmstadt, and then again in Moscow when there was a big meeting of 800 composers, I think something like that, from all over the world, and they talked a lot together, and they were, yeah, they became good friends. 
Yeah, one thing I'm really curious about, I, I spoke a little bit with your brother Larry about this actually, is trying to get a sense of the different cultures that uh, that you and your family were involved in and what that must have been like. This connection with Austria, the fact that you were growing up in Los Angeles as a, as a, as a young girl, and uh, ultimately settling permanently in Europe. Did you have a sense of and this is maybe a silly question, but did you have a sense of connection with Austrian culture when you were quite young? Or was that did that feel very remote to you? Well, I had a grandmother who lived with us for a while, who danced little waltzes with me <laughs> and brought uh, recordings of, uh, you know, Staus waltzes and little, I don't know, and sang little songs of, that they sang to children in Austria. My parents were not exactly excited about Austria at that time, so <laughs> it was not, not so much. And of course, my father wrote this song, which I don't know, I don't think it's one that's played very often, but it's called Wien, Wien, nur du allein, du bist deine Schande nie verzeihen, or something. Anyway, uh, it was against Vienna and Austria. So it was not, you know, he didn't have the best time in growing up in Austria, in Vienna. And as a matter of fact, he then moved to Berlin, and that was where he finally was accepted and, and understood. But uh, yeah, we, he was not particularly Viennese. So your understanding growing up was that you were being raised as Americans. There was no ambiguity Definitely, about that. That's what my, my, family, my father wanted, my, both of my parents wanted. They wanted me and my younger brothers to grow up as Americans because that's where we were living and, and it was a freer country than where they came from. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a recording of you from February 1935 uh, together with your parents that, uh, that can be heard on the Arnold Schoenberg Center website. It's a greeting message recorded for Henrietta Kolisch and you can be heard speaking fluent German. Was German, in fact... Sorry? And it was together from, from when I was when I started speaking. So. Mm -hmm. Well, was German your mother tongue or were you bilingual early on? No, I, I was bilingual. Yeah, I, I spoke German because my mother preferred speaking German most of the time. And no, my father spoke English with us. But, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I understood and spoke both from the beginning. Hmm. I think. I mean, I don't remember the very beginning, but yeah. <laughs> so I, I would love to know what it was like. This is this is a hard thing for me to imagine. What it would have been like being a teenager in Los Angeles in the 1940s, having Arnold Schoenberg as a father. Um, it's it's hard to bridge those two things in a, in a certain sense. He taught he taught in the same university that I studied in later, so. So he was not well known. He was well known in universities, at least USC at first, where I didn't study, but later at UCLA for eight years. So he was quite well known at the university. Did you have a sense already uh, when you were young of his importance, or did that um, was yes. that? Yes. No. Yes, he had the sense, and that's because of. Not because he told us anything, but because it was just obvious from the also the students who came to the house and and you know respected him so much and and also other friends and musicians and artists and poets <laughs> and and especially my mother, who was just a really an enormous support for him because. At times it must have looked really dreary to him to be teaching. Some of his classes were like music A1, and, and his, his students were people who were going to be teaching in uh, high school, not even high school, you know. And, and so they, they weren't really very interested in his sort of teachings. But there were many who were and who were 
and we know because they've also written books about studying with him and one person published the lesson, his notes from his lessons and then went on to other places and did their own things, which is, a, that's a good sign. They didn't copy him, they developed their own thinking and that, that's the most important thing. I wonder if he, if he complained at all at the time. I mean, it, <clears throat> you mentioned that it was, it can't have been easy teaching beginner students, uh, students that would be really uh, approaching music for the first time. Um, and in addition to that, we know that his... It's supposed to be. He was teaching counterpoint and harmony. They should have already known something, but they didn't. No, uh, he, he was an incredible teacher. That's something that many have written about, too. He really cared. He cared about each student in his class. He would say, oh, today, come home, big smile, and all of that. Oh, today I finally got some things across to this girl who never seemed to understand anything. And he had found the way he, he spent, you know, like half a day thinking, how can I make this person understand what I'm trying to explain, you know? And he really cared, he loved to teach. He taught each person individually, even if it was a class, but, you know, he, he tried to, find a way to reach the person's intelligence for what it was and to he, he would say you know oh at least they learned something from me mm. they learned what it is to be an artist or they learned what it is to think about certain problems and and he really thought about these things i mean when he came home tired from having to walk up numerous steps to the top floor of the Royce Hall because they wouldn't give him a, a room, <laughs> a classroom on the ground floor, even when he asked for it because he was already old and had terrible asthma and everything. But if we do it for you, we'd have to do it for everyone, <laughs> was the answer. Well, he, he really, he loved to teach. He, he wanted people to understand and he wrote that somewhere too. You know, in biographical no autobiographical notes, saying as soon as I knew something, I wanted to teach it to someone else. And even as a young man, or yes, yeah, I think it's it's absolutely worth remembering for teachers also that the ultimate goal of teaching music for composition isn't necessarily to make sure that everybody becomes a, a professional. Uh, the, it has many, many, many benefits, and it can. It can train you how to think. It can uh, make you much more sensitive to art and to culture. And it's not by any means necessary to, to try to ensure that everybody becomes a professional composer. Exactly. Hardly anyone, anyway, as I know, became a composer. But that doesn't really matter. That's not why they were there anyway, because a lot of people were just doing because they thought music was easier than mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really curious, what was he like as a father? Was he engaged in your daily life in, in, the, in raising you? Um, was he more distant? Uh, what was that like? It was great. It was great, like having a wonderful father who invented games for us and even made games out of wood and cardboard and little figures and things and who played with us. And then later he played tennis with my brother. Well, he, he was he was just an excellent father, better than most, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Given the context at the time, which was one of World War II, yeah, you, you would have been 13 when World War II ended, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, how aware were you of that at the, at the time? And did your father talk about that at all? Was it, was it a, a topic of family conversations? Oh, we, had, we didn't have television then, but we had the radio. And we listened constantly, and we heard about what was going on. I mean, I did, because my brothers are much younger. I didn't know very much about it, but I knew there was a war. <laughs> and, and, and then he was, uh, he was worried because he had a son from his first marriage who was still living in Vienna. You know, I, I knew about that, let's say. I, I knew that these things were going on. I, I 
that's about as much as you could know when you were that age. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My daughter Serena was sitting over there very shyly and doesn't show, but <laughs> uh, says, you know, that I told her how. Well, I can't remember. What did you say? <laughs> <laughs> how in school you were like? Oh yeah, like in school, these kids, these kids would say, "Oh, you can speak German." I don't know how they, find, you know, so people find out. You, or maybe I said I German. My parents speak German, yeah. so they would say, "Oh, tell me some swear words in German, <laughs> some bad words." You know, this was <laughs> you were in third grade or something. You know. So, so then, since I, you know, they would say, how do you say, well, I can't say that on television, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> how do you say such a bad word in German? And so I, if I didn't, I, I really didn't know the bad words in German, so I would just say something, you know. And they, oh, and then they went home and told their parents that there was this German girl in the class and she was teaching them bad words. <laughs> And I almost got in trouble. <laughs> also, also the idea that I was German, which I wasn't, sometimes played out so that some people thought I was you know, the enemy. So that that was strange. You know, but this was all only in, I guess, the most middle school, not not later, of course. But uh, there were strange things like that, you know. That, okay, that, I mean, they couldn't know, they knew nothing about anything that was going on, and all they knew that the Germans were bad. And, but I wasn't German. <laughs> but I could speak German, <laughs> it doesn't make you a German nationalist. Right, right. Well, did your friends at the time have a an awareness of uh, of your family and and the uniqueness of your father, or or not at all? No, no, they just probably Rick, laughed because they didn't speak English very well. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, no, no, they had no idea. <laughs> I mean, these were children. If we're talking about children, then when I was in high school, nobody cared about anything. I <laughs> think it was just boys and girls. You know? Right. Were you allowed into your father's workroom at all? Do you do you have any memories of oh, seeing him working? That's a good question. You see, because he had his his uh, workroom closed. I mean, there used to be an arc, and it was open, sort of toward the front door, which was not a very good place to have your study. And so he did call a carpenter and have that all closed off, and also a door with you that he could lock because he was always afraid somebody would go in there and throw away his manuscripts. No, really. <laughs> and you know, he said, oh, then the maid's going to go in there and clean and say, oh, what's all this scribbling, throw it away. And so, so he, so that room was locked. But of course, if we wanted to go in to see him or talk to him or he would show us things, then, then we could go. But uh, he didn't just let anybody go in and touch his things because he had two rooms actually. One was his, the room in which he wrote music and studied and had all of his music books. And the second room, which was called the Saitetsima, the second room, was for all of his hobbies. And that we could go to. And they were book binding because he bound. You know, in those days, they used to sell scores unbound, and he would make beautiful bindings. He had fashioned a, a, not a machine, but a structure of wood with all the, the uh, threads that came down and went on the spine on the back of the book. And I don't know, it was, it was very, very complicated, and he did beautiful book binding for many of his scores. And you can see those now in Vienna at the Schoenberg Center. There's a replica of his uh, study from Los Angeles. And you can see these books, which he bound beautifully with leather corners and, and beautiful end papers and, uh, that he designed. 
So he yep. was very good at manual things too, working like that. He liked to do that. He made toys for us. And he made a stop and go sign for for our tricycle and bicycle traffic in the garden. <laughs> and he and mother together because he made the stand with a thing that went stop and go, you know, like that. And, and mother made green lights with batteries so you could turn them on and off. So they, they were great at that. They made so many wonderful toys for us. And I, I can't remember any store-bought toys except except maybe a little car, you know, those little cars that you put pedals on and bicycles, tricycles, bicycles, all that sort of thing. But a lot of toys my father made, and then he made games also, like table games. And of course, he made the beautiful chess set, which is on, which you can see in Vienna, in the Schoenberg Center. But he also made games for us to play playing cards that he drew himself. So he was, you know, he was very, you know, human, you know, like a lot of people. <laughs> he was interested in a lot of different things. And then he also composed. Well, <clears throat> what amazes me about all this is, is just how he managed to do it all, uh, being a professor at a university, uh, pursuing his compositions, writing his textbooks, his uh, more sort of theoretical texts on, on composition and music theory, making all these toys, being involved in the lives of his children. He must have been busy all the time. Yeah, he was. And then when mother would go shopping at the market, he would sit in the car and he always had little pads with him, you know, the, or little booklets, you know, empty ones. And he would be, there are some of those on that you can see in Vienna too, that have maybe on one page, they have a little drawing, and it, it it's a self-portrait of his. And then in German, it says, I can, I'll say it in German, and someone's going to understand, okay? Das ist mein Selbstporträt. Hmm. And then he goes, times one, times one, and the word selbst, which in German, if you read it, is mal ein mal ein selbst, which means draw one yourself, but it's a, a pun, it's sort of a word game. So he was, he was very, he, you know, he did all kinds of things like that. And then and there are these little booklets that he had in the car while he was waiting for mother to do the shopping, in which he, he draws caricatures and all kinds of interesting things. And he had a great sense of humor, which is something that nobody ever suspects, I don't know. <laughs> Like, what? You mean he laughed? He smiled? Yeah. <laughs> and of course, he played with us. And then he, what was funny was that he, you know, he learned science back in the, I don't know, you know, the turn of the century. <laughs> and therefore, his ideas were kind of funny. Although he did show us how the earth <laughs> moves around the sun, because we had this uplighter lamp. And that was the sun. It couldn't look down because it was up lighter, but the light was there, okay? And then he had a little ball on a string, and you would go around it, and you could see how that lit up the world from different sides, you know? And that was the, yeah, the, the sun and the world, the earth. Hmm. So he did lots of things for us played games with us, invented games. And he was very interested in my brother's tennis. He loved to go to the matches and watch him play. He even uh, made up a set of symbols for recording my brother's matches when he was playing in tournaments. And it was like you could, re you could go over your match afterwards and see what you did wrong. So you can do it better next time. It's doing better next time. He did want us always to do a little better next time. <laughs> With that in mind, what do you think he would have made of Luigi Nono? Because presumably they never met. No, they never met. 
Well, I'm sure he would have respected him very much as he did all of his students who were, had talent and did original things. And I don't think he, I think he would have been very supportive. I've often wondered what he might have thought about the Darmstadt generation, in, in part because there seems to be such a significant difference uh, between the culture that your father grew up with and the circumstances that the, the composers born in the 1920s were dealing with when they were young, in the post-war, immediate post-war period, and the quite radical music that was coming out of that period as well. Do you think uh, Arnold Schoenberg would have appreciated these innovations? Would he have been curious about them? Or would some of them... Innovation is, innovation is a word, word that we're talking about now with my brother, too, as a really a word that, that uh, identifies Schoenberg and defines him, and which certainly for him was extremely important. And not just to be new or modern or something like that, but just because it means going forward mm -hmm. with what you know. You have to have all the baggage behind you of everything that everyone else has done before. And then when you know all of that, then you go on from there. And that, that was his way of thinking. You know? And then innovation was not waking up one morning and saying, I'm going to do something really different. This is going to really shock the world. You know? That's not it. <laughs> mm -hmm, of course, yeah. Tell us a little bit about the circumstances of your meeting with Luigi Nono. How did you get to know him? Oh, that was very nice. I, uh, my mother and I came back to Europe for the first time after we had left in 1933, I guess. Uh, we came to hear the first performance of Moses and Aaron in concert form in Hamburg at the radio. This was actually, yes, the first time that we had come back to Europe after, after the war. And it was very exciting for me, of course. And I'd never been, I mean, I'd never been in Germany except when I was a year old, so I had no idea. But I spoke German because we spoke German and English at home. Mm -hmm. And that was so strange for me because in America, well, even at the university, I mean, very few people knew who Arnold Schoenberg was, even though he taught there for eight years. And certainly what they knew was not the way people knew back in, in Europe when he was living there before. So, so when I got there, and then all these people would come up to me and say, oh, you're the daughter of Arnold Schoenberg. Can I touch you? No, <laughs> touch me. <Yeah. laughs> <I'm just> doing... <laughs> Craziness. And so I was shocked. I couldn't believe it, you know, because never had I seen. And then whole audiences, you know, who clapped for 15 minutes after the first performance of Moses and Aaron as a concert performance because it hadn't yet been performed on the stage. Uh, it was just amazing for me, I, and it was wonderful. And then all these people, oh, they're so lucky to be the daughter of the jury. You know, this had never happened to me in America. So, so that was very special. So what happened when you went to Darmstadt and were presented as Schoenberg's daughter? Was uh, Did that... Uh arouse a great deal well, of interest? Different, different, different things. Uh, <laughs> uh, some people thought that was very interesting and nice. And, you know, stuff. Mm -hmm. and then other people, oh, there's a, a pupil. I, I don't think, you know, he was a pupil of Webern, uh, who was a composer very well known and was teaching at Darmstadt. And I had brought I had brought the score of Moses and Aaron with me because mother didn't want to take it home. And, you know, she was flying and it was heavy and big. And, uh, and so I brought it to Darmstadt to show it. And so I was standing there at the table and showing this, and there were a lot of people crowded around to looking at it. And all of a sudden, this man came up and pushed everybody aside and pushed me aside. And 
And she said, you know, you want to look at it. You know? And I, you know, I said, wait a minute, you know, this is my score. <laughs> You know, I, and he said, well, who are you? You know, I said, where are you, Sandrick? Oh, if I had known that, I wouldn't have pushed you. <laughs> Can you believe that? <laughs> so I had very different experiences there from people, you know, on the one hand, being ridiculous in that sense, mm -hmm. and others who were wonderful to get to know. And then I knew all the young composers, and with that, in the first years, they were all friends and everything. You know, at the beginning, Stockhausen, Boulez, Gigi, Pousseur, I don't know, a lot of, I mean, they were all young and trying to get their music played. And, and it was very, the first years were terrific and it was really wonderful. And then, of course, then they say each one of them wanted to have, you know, his own glory. And Yeah, I understand uh, uh, Luigi Nono had a bit of a falling out with Pierre Boulez. I don't know. They were very good friends at first, and Gigi had gone to Paris and had uh, heard concerts that, that uh, Boulez was organizing, and, and they were friends. And I don't think they were really, you know, they weren't against each other because they both respected each other enormously. And I remember when Boulez came to Venice, I guess it was after my husband's death, and somebody asked him, and it was a big, uh, he was giving a lecture or something, and somebody asked him about Nona, you know, and, and he said, well, I have the greatest respect for him and everything, you know. Well, these things happen, you know, and if you say one word and somebody else hears it, then, then immediately that becomes, you know, like, that's what you really think all the time. It's not like that. You know, sometimes you can be, you can be polemical with, with a person, be against something that somebody is doing or saying or believing, but it doesn't mean that you forever you're going to hate that person and you don't have any respect for them. And, and Gigi always had respect for others, always. What was, his, <clears throat> what was his personality like when you first got to know him? How, how would you describe him as a person? Oh, he loved me. <laughs> 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 it was very nice. I can't tell you, I don't know what to say. But he was <laughs> <laughs> no, he was very sure of himself, and he. So we had arguments right at the beginning too, because I don't know. He would say, "Oh, this person is like the greatest composer," and something like that. But young people, you know. Like, I don't know. So I don't know what did he do? What's so special? You know. And I remember a big argument with him about some, something like that, about some, no, it was about a conductor, I think, who was doing a concert and, and he was against something. And I thought, you know, that he, the conductor had the right to play what he wanted to. That was, I think, the first big argument we had, but it was, it was nothing, you know, I mean, you kiss and make up. So. During the uh, 1960s, your husband started to make explicit references to politics, uh, contemporary politics in his work. Um, I'm wondering how that came about. It was a, a gradual process, and did he discuss his political convictions with you at the time? Well, it wasn't just him, you know, it was all of Italy. So, so you have to think that Italy had come out of a, a period with the fascist regime. And the people who were against that and managed to put it down were communists, socialists, Christian Democrats, others like that. And they, you know, it was something that I don't think happened in very many other countries. This was the majority of the people who didn't want to go back to fascism and they also didn't want to go to a, to a democratic, Catholic party ruling, because that also had, you know, a, 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 well, I don't know. Anyway, they didn't want <laughs> many of them. And so actually there, there were all the, not all, but most of the cultural 
writers, filmmakers, musicians, composers, were more or less on the left. And that was naturally a, a reaction to what they had gone through under a fascist regime for many years, and under which very many people died in concentration camps and, um, and also as soldiers and you know, in wars. So, you know, you can't just judge these things or, or try to understand them if you just say, oh, well, in America, it's like this, we have this, this, this. It's not the same thing. These people first had gone through fascism, where people were treated in the most horrible way with concentration camps and, and being shot on the street. And I mean, you know, really bad and no freedom at all I and mean, in schools the teachers were all all had to be party members and stuff like that and and therefore they they knew what they knew how bad it could get okay and they wanted something different and therefore the, the left was what was different from this very far right so I can see, I mean, when I first came here, I was an American home with me, communists and everything. But these communists were, they weren't Russians, you know, they were not, they were not Stalin or something. You know? They were people who were against fascism and who wanted a better, more liberal and more mm, humane society. And, and so these are things that people from like from America, if they haven't studied them or haven't don't know about them very much, they they kind of just floss over everything, and then it's just oh, you know, huh? yeah. well, you, you sometimes have to know a little about history before you can judge people for what they do. I wonder if he was criticized for that at the time, because I mean, it's something that I think sets him apart from some of his contemporaries, because uh, there's basically no explicit political references in any of Boulez or Stockhausen's works. Uh, mm -hmm. But with, uh, with your husband's work, it does start to become uh, quite clear, especially in the 1960s. D did that set him aside from his colleagues in, in any way at that time? Some of them, yes. Some of them didn't understand or didn't like it or didn't didn't like it anyway. They didn't like what he wrote, and they didn't like what he stood for. So that's all right. He probably didn't like what they did either. No, I know, and he was not, you know, they didn't fight or anything, you know. Everyone did his own thing, and we went to Darmstadt, and they were all performed from, from, from the Germans who were there, the Poles. A lot of people from Poland who were copying Cage, for instance, because they wanted to be, you know, modern. And which is nothing wrong with Cage, because Cage is, was a very strong individual and, and did very interesting things. But it was silly for a Pole to do the things that Cage did, because he didn't come from, that was my husband's position was that, you come from what you live through, where, where you come from. You know, you don't just go and pick out something from that has nothing to do with your background or where you, what you live through or what your background, yeah, background is. Mm -hmm. What do you think he hoped for, for his, for his own work? What, what effect did he hope it would have on the world and on culture at large? I don't think he's thought about that. He just expressed what he what he wanted to say and hoped that it would be played well, performed well, and he was happy if people liked it. That's that's human, you know. If, if there was a lot of success, and and there usually was anyway, so that's not <laughs> it wasn't a problem. I mean, I don't think I've ever I ever went to anything where people booed his work, you know, <laughs> usually the performance. And he was very lucky in this, 
in that he had very good performers who liked his work. And so people like Severino Gazzelloni on the flute, well, he was the best. And whatever he played was fantastic. And, and when he played these works, he worked on them and, and invented new ways to make new, newer sounds or different ways of producing sound. And when Rudolf Kolisch, my uncle actually, made the violin works, he also, you know, he worked with my husband on new sounds and new techniques. And things. so, so, you know, that he did a lot with that. And, and with all of these people who worked with him, he was very lucky because he had some of the very best performers also who were interested in, in new music and wanted to play wanted to do more with their instruments than they had up to then. And that he was very interested in that in expanding the possibilities of a certain instrument. Well, what I find remarkable is he also had the support of performers who were established classical stars. In other words, who weren't uh, sort of contemporary music specialists, but people like Claudio Abado and, uh, and Polini certainly were also yes. very engaged in performing his work. They were, they were. It's pretty good music too. I mean, you know, <laughs> they understood that. There was no other reason for them to do it. Yeah, of course, of course. You know, they didn't need to. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't wow. to boost their own careers. Wow. And they knew. <clears throat> they understood it. What he was trying to do, and they interpreted it in a fantastic way, yes. and it helped a lot because to have the best pianist play your work and like it and feel it. And it was very interesting about Polini that once uh, they were taught, he was talking to Gigi about, about his uh, piece for piano. And, and he said, yes, and then in the part where, the, I don't know, the child cries or something like that. You know? <laughs> and she looked at her and said, well, what do you mean? Well, I feel that this is what I you know. And he had invented a whole story to that piece for himself oh. when he played. He imagined a whole, a whole scene, a whole scene. Oh, that's fascinating. That's a yeah, that's, that's lovely to hear. He was really surprised and didn't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, where there's the this and that. And, but people, but but performers do that. It's a, also prefer memorizing the work. And mm -hmm. Also, a lot of these people played by memory, even on these difficult pieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's amazing. You you mentioned that he was also interested in exploring new instrumental techniques, uh, particularly in some of the later works. Yes. Uh, I wonder if you could just talk a, a little bit about that. Um, I'm fascinated by pieces such as the string quartet or Prometeo, which are really unique creations. I mean, there's nothing else that sounds like them. But mm -hmm. they also seem to call for a new type of listener. You know, yes. they're, they're often quite slow, uh, extremely detailed in their notation. Uh, in the case of Prometeo, it's written in several languages simultaneously. Uh, there's all these different layers of uh, voices and instruments and spatialization and electronics. And how would you recommend that an audience um, who is coming to these works for the first time approach them? Well, if you just sit there and it's done the way it's supposed to be, and it's maybe all the music is coming from all different sides and moving around the room like it does sometimes, like you have one sound that just goes all the way around the room because of the loudspeaker system that they use, or I don't know, I mean, uh, Prometeo is very, it has lots and lots of different things in it, but there are moments where you feel just entirely surrounded by music, and there are other moments where there's just one sound moving around the whole room. And these are things that we're not used to, but when you're there and, you, and you're listening, because that's you do have to listen. It's not going to just hit you. You listen actively, then, then it's just amazing because you, 
you can practically see the sounds move in the room and go from one side to the other. And a lot of these, like in Prometheo and other works just before that, it's you just have to be open to it. You have to want to listen. You know, it says open your ears, you know. It's, well, <clears throat> what did he mean by, uh, excuse the pronunciation, tra tragedia dell'ascolta, the tragedy of listening? Oh, I never could understand that. I don't, I don't know what it means, but it's not like, it's like tragedy in theater compared to comedy in the old sense, not, you know, like, oh, tragedy, you know, like that. Mm -hmm. And so a tragedy, I think, is also a history of something, a story of something that, you know, like in the old Greek sense or something. Ah. Tragedy in the sense of of Aeschylus and the and the, yeah. the the Greek authors that he was uh, yeah. right yeah. yeah Greek tragedy. So I, I want to be respectful of your time, but I, I just have a few more questions, if I may. Um, do you have any recollection of Helmut Lachenmann coming to the house, the young Lachenmann? Oh yes, because we were young. I mean, I he's about I don't know two or three years younger than I am. And and he was just a you know a young kid who came to study with with Gigi and he brought his what he had done with his former teacher and Gigi Gigi didn't like to teach because usually it meant the other person I don't know wasn't far enough along to be able to 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 learn something from him you know so so when Helmut came and talked to him and told him about what he wanted to do, he was convinced immediately because he was a fantastic person and then he accepted him right away and, and, and they worked together and he would, you know, he didn't do classical sort of teaching, but they would talk about all the things and Henwood would bring his things and then, they, you know, discuss them together and I'm still in touch with him. All the time, they became really great friends. Yeah, what was he? What was he like as a young man? I'm I'm curious. Was he um, introverted, passionate? Um, how would you describe him? <laughs> he was very sure of himself, <clears throat> and he was. I don't know if I would say passionate, but but yes, I mean he was really into what he was doing and and convinced about. You know what he's doing, what he's doing. I don't know. I, I can't say very much, but he was. We became very good friends, and we still are. So, well, confidence is an interesting word because you said the same about your husband, and mm -hmm. uh, it, I suppose, in a certain sense, you need to have that kind of extraordinary confidence in order to launch a career as an artist. Anyway, you, have, you know, you have both. You have confidence in what you what you want to do and what you're doing, and then you can have great doubts, too. I mean, the thing about doubt comes out all the time, and well, he talked a lot about it, you know, but then he would overcome those doubts and do what he felt he had to do. Mm -hmm. I think doubts are like, they're like exams that you do to yourself, you know? You're wondering if you're really doing what you want to do, to do it that way. It, it means you're not just throwing out some stuff, you're thinking about it. I think, I mean, I don't know that. I just, I'm just saying this now right off the top of my head. No, I think that's right. I think an artist will tend to subject everything they do to the purifying fires of their own critical sense. Their own, that's right. Yeah. yeah. How do you imagine your husband would have reacted to the period that we're currently living through? I don't know. I can't say. That's something I really can't. And I know people always ask me that and about my father, too. What would your father say to such and such? I don't know. I'm glad he doesn't have to live through this. <laughs> it's not a very good period. <clears throat> Well, how do you view the present state of uh, of composition of, uh, of of younger composers? Are you following any particular uh, younger artists at the moment? Uh, I sometimes try to. I mean, I, I try to listen. I when I can get a CD or 
something on the radio or something or television. I don't know very well, very much. I, I'm sure there are people who are going forward and doing new things that are not just new. I mean, not just modern, you know, I mean, but, but things where they're developing something that has already been going for centuries. But I don't know. I, I don't hear so much new music, really, because there isn't so much around here. Even, even the Biennale and things like that, I haven't really lately heard anything too exciting. But then I don't really get around that much, so I can't say. Okay, fair enough. Well, thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. It's been fascinating talking with you, and I'm deeply appreciative that you took the time to do it. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it, was a, it was a great pleasure.